Every male member of my immediate family served in the Vietnam War. But it was an event long after the guns fell silent on that country's battlefields that triggered a change in my attitude about that conflict. In 1988, my older brother Elmo died from Agent Orange-related cancers linked to his service as a swift boat commander during the Vietnam War. In a bitter irony of that conflict for our family, it was the actions of my father, Admiral Elmo R. Zumwalt, Jr., in ordering the spraying of Agent Orange along the river and canal banks of the Delta region when he commanded all U.S. naval forces in Vietnam that sealed my brother's fate. For years after Elmo's death, my brother's loss embittered me towards the conflict and the enemy we had fought there. Hello and welcome to this edition of Top Vietnam. You've just heard James G. Zumwalt, who is an American vet veteran back in the war here in Vietnam, confide in what he calls the tragedy of his family. Now, James is the younger son of Admiral Elmo R. Zumwalt, Jr., who was the commander of the U.S. Naval Forces here in Vietnam back in 1968, and who was also the man who um, approved the use of Agent Orange during the war. The death of James' brother, Elmo, uh, later on due to Agent Orange-related cancers has brought him many animosity towards the uh, country of Vietnam as well as towards the conflict here in Vietnam in general. His trip in 1994 back to Vietnam, however, has changed his way of thinking about Vietnam, its people, and the war in general. And he's here with us on our show, Talk Vietnam Today, to share with us what he calls the stories of, uh, from the other side of Vietnam's battlefield, how they have changed his perspectives, and also how they have changed, to some extent, his entire life. Now, Thank you very much, Mr. Zumwalt, for joining us here on Talk Vietnam today. Thank you very much for having me. Now, your trip this time coincides with uh, the National Reunification Day, April 30th here in Vietnam, a day that for many Vietnamese, uh, it holds a lot of feelings and emotions. Um, what about for you? What do you think of uh, this time and how it coincides with this date? Obviously, it. Uh triggers a different emotion on, on my side than uh, it does for the, the Vietnamese. I, uh, uh, I, we lost 58,000 Americans in the Vietnam War and uh, to have lost uh, that many lives and not prevailed is uh, a difficult pill to swallow. Yes, it's a very different feeling obviously. Um, can you talk a little bit about your time uh, based here in the country during the war. When uh, was that and where were you based? Actually, my first tour in 1969, I was uh, in the Navy uh, initially. My, I uh, was on a destroyer that provided naval gunfire support off of uh, I-Corps. Um, in uh, 1972 to 73, I, I had, prior to that, I had switched to the Marine Corps. I was a uh, infantry platoon commander and uh, infantry company commander and I was part of a battalion landing team, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, that was a reaction force uh, during that time period. Back in those days, what were some of the impressions that were left um, in you during those days, some of the memories that still stick? I remember my first impression of Vietnam. Uh, we were on board ship, we were approaching the coastline, uh, and about three miles out at sea, I was looking through binoculars and I, I saw what looked like a, a Vietnamese fisherman walking on the water and as we got closer I realized that he was in a basket uh, that he had woven and taken that far out to sea to uh, uh, get food for his family and it, it amazed me that uh, uh, somebody would have ventured that far out you know, off the coast in uh, a makeshift basket like that but it kind of uh, drove the point home that uh, these are very resilient people that we're, uh, we're going to be facing. Now your brother, um, as we know, who was also based in Vietnam, um, and later on he passed away due to Agent Orange related cancers. Um, after that very tragic event, obviously, for your family, uh, did you feel any kind of bitterness? What were some of your feelings after well, that event? My two heroes in my life were my father and my brother. It was 
you know, you, you look at a, a brother who's two and a half years older than you, having him around for a long time, growing old with him, uh, all that was, was wiped away. And it did generate uh, a lot of anger, uh, anger, <clears throat> anger towards the war and anger towards the enemy we fought there. Looking back on it now, I fully recognize the fact that it's misguided anger, that uh, I think all too often when we feel an emotion such as anger that we have a tendency to uh, direct it in the wrong direction, and that's what I did. Now, as I said in the beginning, you later on uh, went back to Vietnam in 1994. What changed you? What led you to this decision of going to Vietnam? In 1994, my, uh, my father had asked uh, permission to go to Vietnam to meet with President Lee Duc An to uh, see if he could get agreement to do a joint study on, on Agent Orange. Um, he asked me if I wanted to go with him and initially I was reluctant to do so, but uh, my, my father told me he thought it would be good for me to, to go and uh, so uh, since he was my hero I, I uh, abided by his wish and, and went on that trip to Vietnam. We. Uh, we were there for a week. I, uh, about the, the first couple of days that we had meetings, again, I found an, I was getting a knot in my stomach uh, sitting across the table from veterans who uh, had killed so many of my countrymen. That changed on the third day. I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, Major General Fun, who uh, was a medical doctor. He uh, started the meeting by extending his condolences for the loss of my brother. And as we talked about the war and its impact, he got a little teary-eyed. And I came to realize later that he too had lost a brother. And when he shared that with me, it was kind of like a light went on. And I asked myself, was the loss of a loved one any less significant just because it occurred on the other side of the battlefield? And the answer was obviously no. That was something that was devastating to both of us. And. Uh, it was that point in time that I realized it was very important for me to return to Vietnam and start interviewing their veterans to get a better perspective as to what the war was like on their side of the battlefield. After all these trips uh, to Vietnam ever since 1994, uh, what do you, did you realize through the stories of your former enemies uh, that you think might help other veterans like yourself? Well, let me preface that with saying <clears throat> in all the other wars that America fought, it emerged victorious. And it was a lot easier when you defeated an enemy to, after the war, embrace him. And that is what we did with the, uh, the Japanese in World War II. Um, when you lose a war and you know that your countrymen died in vain, uh, it's a lot more difficult to, uh, uh, to bridge that gap. And uh, that was, I, I think that is something that many American veterans, a gap that many American veterans have had trouble bridging. I think as the years go on, it's more and more are becoming accepting of it. But uh, I know that there still are those that uh, are, are dug in and will not uh, try to bridge that gap. So you just mentioned about this gap of uh, a lot of American veterans need to kind of bridge after uh, years after the war. So what would you tell people who are still experiencing animosity or um, basically this bitterness that you had once felt uh, towards Vietnam? Well, I try to share with them my story. Uh, if, if I can change, anybody can change. And I think it really requires that you be educated. And uh, there's no better way to get a better feel 
for the enemy that we fought than to go back over there and sit down and talk to them and understand uh, why they fought for what they fought for. We may not agree with the reasons for their fighting, but we must respect the fact that they were very courageous on the battlefield. You can't just ignore that. That is a given. And I think if you learn that and you appreciate the fact that we were dealing with a very formidable force, you've got to respect them and that will move you away from the anger. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, people who are affected by the Agent Orange Jackson here in the country, have you been able, in your visits here to the to Vietnam, um, been able to visit some of those family visits, some of the victims um, affected? Yes, uh, we did on our first trip back in 1994, and I have uh, been introduced to families along the way who uh, who have children who have, have suffered from the effects of Asian Orange. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, your visit to these families throughout uh, the years, obviously there are have been uh, some memories, that stories that still stick to mind. Um, any, any that you would like to share? Well, it's, uh, frankly, it's, <clears throat> It's very emotional for me to see what these children are going through. My heart goes out to them. I so much wish I could wave a wand and everything would be right. But I think it's important that the government of Vietnam work very closely with the U.S. government. And it is my hope that at some point in time, the U.S. government will recognize its moral responsibility to help set up a trust fund for Vietnamese veterans and their families who have been affected by, by Agent Orange. The Vietnam War claimed the lives of more than 58,000 American and 1.1 million Vietnamese soldiers. Thirty-six years after the war, the consequences linger on. Up to 200 American veterans are believed to have been exposed to Agent Orange. In Vietnam, this number is more than 4.8 million. Over 3 million people were the victims of the 80 million liters of Agent Orange sprayed by the U.S. Army during the war. Tens of thousands have died of Agent Orange-related cancers. Millions more and their children and even their grandchildren are living with disabilities, deformities and misery caused by this toxic chemical. It's been seven years since James last visited Mai and her husband, who had introduced him to the very first inspiring characters for his then future book, Bare Feet Iron Will. The latter now has gone. Coming from a point in my life where I perceived the enemy as being very vicious. Uh, he was a, uh, a wake-up call for me. And I, he was a very gentle soul, very compassionate man. Uh, as I spoke to him, he disarmed me of any of my, my preconceived notions. Uh, and that's why I, uh, I suffered his loss, too, when he passed away two years ago. Mai's husband, Major General Nguyen Don Tu, was known as a pioneer in the quest for justice for Agent Orange dioxin victims here in Vietnam. Tu himself was exposed to this toxic chemical when he fought in Guangxi in 1972. His smallest daughter was born with abnormalities a year later. Khi mà ông ấy đến gia đình chúng tôi thì nói chuyện với nhà tôi thì chỉ nói về cái chuyện là da cam ấy. Thế và ông cũng nói rằng những cái việc mà phải chịu đựng của từng gia đình này thì gia đình bên ý cũng chịu đựng gia đình với tôi. Thế là có cái sự đồng cảm và hiểu nhau là về sự các cháu như thế, về bệnh bệnh tật của các cháu. Thế và rồi gần gũi nhau thứ nói chuyện như thế thì có sự đồng cảm và ông rất thông cảm. Thành ra cũng như là bao giờ ra chúng tôi phải thăm các cháu, tôi cũng vừa phải thăm các cháu bên thì nói tóm lại tức là mối quan hệ trên cái tinh thần là là, là với sự đồng cảm.
cháu của ông ấy còn nói được, tôi ông ấy nói được và đi lại được. Nó vào nó ở trong cái cái cộng đồng của những cái đứa nữa. Nhưng mà cháu nhà tôi thì không đi lại được và cũng không nói được. Tức là cháu hoàn toàn phụ thuộc vào một cái người trông cháu. Thì dìu cháu đi lại, thì ăn thì cho cháu ăn. Mình nói thì rất là cả gia đình từ bà với bố mẹ là thì luyện với cháu nhưng cũng không được vì nó là bẩm sinh cũng rất là James took the chance to present to Mai and her family a Vietnamese copy of his just released book Bare Feet Iron Wheel as a special gift by a long-time friend who, despite being far away, understands them and displays his respect. Now, your family is a family of a, a strong legacy within uh, the military, is that right? A tradition of military service going back to our American Revolution, uh, 235 years, 36 years. Uh, we've had uh, a zumwalt in just about every war this country has ever fought. My uh, my grandfather was in the Army, but my father was in the Navy, uh, my brother was in the Navy, I was in the Navy and Marine Corps, and uh, my son just got back last year from his second combat tour where he was a a bomb technician for the Navy defusing IEDs, the, the roadside bombs. So, uh, that's, that's how I got all my gray hair. Yeah. Now going back to uh, the efforts of your father, you said he was able to basically turn his, um, this tragic event within your family into positive uh, action. Right. And uh, how, can you talk a little bit about how your father's mindset basically changed um, after the death of your brother? My, my brother died. My, my father was just curious as to whether or not the, the government was recognizing any correlation and, and, and saw that it wasn't and realized that that had to be wrong. Uh, my father also felt that a military commander has an obligation for those who served under him in a war. The obligation continues even though the guns on the battlefields fall silent. He, he was out of the, the military, he had retired. Uh, he was the most senior commander to ever get involved in the, uh, the Agent Orange issue. He was the most senior military commander who served in Vietnam to return to Vietnam. Uh, but he was determined to do everything in his power till the day he died to procure benefits for our veterans. Uh, if he had lived long enough, he would be leading the charge also to get the U.S. government to recognize its moral responsibility to help the Vietnamese veterans as well. Up until he was uh, 73, he still came to Vietnam, right? You, uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about this trip? There was one Vietnamese veteran who had lost both legs and was given his first wheelchair. and It was very emotional for me to see my father at age 73 pick up this uh, disabled veteran and put him in his first wheelchair and the the joy in that veteran's eyes uh, in receiving that chair was something I'll never forget. The 400 page book Bare Feet Iron Wheel is a fruit of nearly 200 interviews James Zumwalt conducted during more than 50 trips here in Vietnam ranging from those with famous generals to those ordinary men and women, soldiers and civilians. Through the interviews, he understands that there are no boundaries for suffering in warfare. It truly is universal. James was amazed by the patience and ingenuity of Vietnamese people. Above all, he admired their iron will, which he saw as the most powerful strength that led to their victory over a superpower like the US the iron wheel that he says he salutes with all respect. So, Bare Feet Iron Wheel is a very short but also very inspiring title. Can you tell us a little bit about the idea behind this title, how it came to be about? Well, in interviewing Vietnamese veterans, I interviewed uh, some soldiers who had been in the artillery and uh, they told me there was an expression they had as they would uh, travel through the jungle carrying these heavy artillery rounds on their backs and the, uh, the expression was bare feet, strong back 
And so uh, when they told me that, I started thinking about the title and, and thought that bare feet reflected the, uh, the connotation that Vietnam was a third world country. It did not have the, uh, the technology of a superpower like the United States. And uh, Iron Will, to me, reflected their commitment, uh, despite that differential, to be able to uh, stay the course and uh, fight as long as it took to, uh, to prevail. Um, what do you think uh, about how the Vietnam had, had managed to basically survive all of these hardships throughout the war, um, fighting against such a superpower? Well, as I started interviewing the veterans, and it became clear that, that everybody shared that iron will. I, I asked myself, was this something that came about as a result of having to fight a superpower? And so I decided to go back and, and study more of Vietnam's uh, previous history. And I found that this had always been the case whenever Vietnam confronted a larger power. They came up with very creative ways of defeating the enemy. And I came to realize that it was not just isolated to uh, the Vietnam War. This, this was part of the Vietnamese DNA. So the start of this book has been since 1994, right, ever since your first trip. And since then, you've made some 52, this is probably your 53rd or 54th trip. Yes, uh, probably around there. Yeah. And during uh, these trips, wh wh which part of the country did you go to? What did you do? It, it would depend on where I could get the most uh, interviews of, of veterans. Uh, initially, it was in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, and then I, I started getting opportunities in Da Nang and some other places. So uh, there were two times that I rented a car and a driver and actually drove from uh, Ho Chi Minh City up to Hanoi. Uh, so uh, that was quite an experience. Yes, uh, but I, I would go wherever I could, uh, I could get the most interviews. Through your interviews, what were some of the stories or what were some of the answers that you were seeking for? I wanted to better understand how they were able to defeat a superpower. And, uh, you know, I, one of the things that, that surprised me initially was to learn how long their tours of duty were. You know, in our case, it was 12 to 13 months, and then we were rotated out, and uh, somebody might have a year or two off and then come back for a second tour. In their case, there was no limit on their tour. Um, as, uh, as one veteran said, it was, it was either death or near de death that ended their, their tour. Uh, so it gave me a lot of respect for the fact that they were there so much longer than, than we were, and they were able to stay motivated to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And these stories obviously really inspired you to kind of compilate all of those stories into one um, final book. Exactly, and I, you know, as I started the interviews, I asked myself how many different war stories could, say, a dozen or 15 different Vietnamese veterans have, but everyone had a different story. Everyone shed uh, additional light that sh showed me the spectrum of creativity they were able to to use. Um, would you like for me to give an example or two of that? Uh, well, the, uh, they had a, a knack of uh, allowing us to see things there that really weren't. And uh, by that I mean uh, when they would dig the tunnels of Coochie, they obviously had a problem getting rid of excess dirt. So where they could, they would spread it in the jungle. Uh, if there was a, uh, a B-52 crater, they would fill in a, a B-52 crater, but a lot of times they had to do something with this dirt. So they, they would get some of their, more of their creative artists together and they would build termite mounds. Uh, so from the air, we would see these termite mounds and we would think, nothing of it, but that was really the excess dirt from the, uh, the digging of the Coochie Tunnels. Uh, another example was uh, the concept of the submarine bridge. Uh, they, we knew that they were crossing rivers at certain points, and they knew, we knew that, so they would build uh, some bridges with the sole purpose of us having a target to, uh, to attack. And e several miles either upstream or downstream from that, they would build 
a submarine bridge, which was a bridge platform about a foot and a half under the low water mark. And as you know, the waters of Vietnam are called brown water for a, for a reason. So if you were in an aircraft up above, you couldn't see this platform. Just on, they, they would either have guides that would stand on the edge of the platform as the convoys came through or else would, would build a, uh, some kind of a, uh, a stake uh, to stick up so the trucks knew to, to drive in between the, the stakes. But it, uh, it was a very ingenious way of getting across uh, the rivers and not letting us know that, uh, that they were doing it at those locations. So I, I, I have the utmost respect for what they were able to do and, and how they, they did it. conducting these 200, uh, nearly over 200 interviews, going to Vietnam for over 50 trips. Um, what is the biggest impression that has been left in you about the Vietnamese people? I guess the biggest impression they've left me with is that uh, no matter how severe the challenge, they will rise to it. Uh, they just have an innate ability to, to rise to it. You know. They, there, there are people who look back at the Vietnam War, uh, American critics who said, well, if only we had, uh, uh, the, our politicians had allowed the military to fight the war the way it needed to be fought, it would have been a different outcome. I think it would have, the only different outcome would have been that it would have driven the Vietnamese out of the cities, into the jungles, but they would come right back and start hitting us. Uh, and it, unless you're on the ground controlling territory, you don't, you don't win by just fighting an air battle. So uh, they would have come right back at us and continued to, to uh, hit us and hit us and hit us until they prevailed. They spent over a century fighting the French and were finally able to, to drive them out. And uh, I, uh, I don't see any difference with uh, uh, if, if our military had been allowed to fight the war the way that they wanted to fight it. Exactly. So just basically left a really big impression on you after all of those interviews um, and visits. Now let's talk more about the book. Um, the book begins with a section on medical care. Why so? Well, I, I thought the best way to start this book was to show people in the West what they should very easily understand, and that is the medical conditions that we had were far superior to what the Vietnamese had. Uh, yet, again, they rose to the challenge and were able to do everything they could do. The, there, were, there were conditions that were just unfathomable by, by our standards. The, for example, their, their operating rooms were underground and uh, they, uh, they had generators, but oftentimes they didn't have fuel for the generators, so they, they couldn't refrigerate blood. Well, doctors and nurses would donate their blood prior to surgery. Uh, they would conduct brain surgeries with, uh, without anesthesia. Uh, the, the patient basically had no choice. Either they would hold him down, he would eventually go unconscious, uh, but it was either operate or die. Uh, again, conditions totally unfathomable by our standards were a way of life. For them. Now, talking a little bit about the uh, current situation of missing in actions, MIAs, um, the uh, United States currently have about 2,000 MMAs that they are uh, trying to locate. Um, the number for the Vietnamese is still around 300,000. Um, those were just the countable losses, not even talking about the under uncountable losses that were um, are still lingering up until now. What do you think Vietnam and the United States should uh, do in order to help each other more in terms of healing the pains of war? Well, I think one of the things that is happening with the American veterans, I'm, I'm seeing more and more 
effort to try and encourage our veterans who were involved for, in battles where they, they knew that some of the remains of the enemy were, were buried to, uh, uh, to forward that information so that we can help the Vietnamese locate their, their MIAs. Um, you know, in, in the book, I, I point out the fact that the, uh, if you take the number of MIAs that Vietnam had, the number of MIAs that America had based on their 1975 populations, it works out one in every 10,000 Americans was affected by the loss of an MIA. It works out to one in every 83 Vietnamese who was affected by the loss of, a, of an MIA. That, that makes it very clear that it was much more devastating uh, for the Vietnamese than it was to the, to the Americans. Not, not to take away from the fact that any loss of life is, is important, but just if you try to quantify it, it was much more of an impact on the Vietnamese people than it was on the American people. Exactly. Those figures definitely um, speak up a lot. Um, the iron will that we talk about um, in your book, what do you think motivated it in each of the Vietnamese people back in the war days? I think it was uh, survival. Um, they knew they had a mission. Um, their motivation wasn't too much different than ours. I, I, I don't know of any Vietnamese soldier I interviewed who said I wanted to die on the battlefield. I mean, he, he wanted to survive. He wanted to go back uh, to his family. He wanted to pursue a, uh, a fruitful life. And those were the same motivations we had. But they knew that, uh, the Vietnamese knew that to get there, they had to defeat a superpower. And so they just locked into step and were able to come up with this iron will to, uh, to fight us. Um, from this book, you obviously kind of re-portray uh, the image of the Vietnamese people um, in the minds of uh, the American veterans and the Americans in general. Uh, what were some of the reception to your book when it first came out? I would say that most American veterans uh, appreciated my effort. Uh, they thought it, it's important to understand the uh, Vietnamese mindset. Um, there were some who thought I was trying to glamorize the, the, uh, the enemy we fought there, and I, I tried to explain to them this was not an effort to glamorize the enemy, this was an effort to humanize the enemy. And uh, uh, to, to be able to better understand how they were able to accomplish what they uh, had to accomplish, you have to understand the human element and the sacrifices they were willing to make. And so uh, I felt it was important because there's been so much published in the West from the American perspective and even the, the South Vietnamese perspective. But until this book came out, uh, really nothing that we've seen. Is seeing the former enemy as a brave and heroic figure still something very difficult? would you say for some of the Americans? I, I'd say it's becoming less and less so. I, I think uh, particularly as more and more American veterans have bridged that gap and made a return trip to, to Vietnam and they see uh, this is not a people that harbors animosity towards that war. You titled the epilogue of the book Lest We Forget. What should we not forget here? I think the message that's clear is uh, one that was first espoused 2,500 years earlier by uh, the uh, great military, Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu. He wrote a book entitled The Art of War, and in it he enunciates various principles of warfare that a commander should master. Uh, and one of those is you never engage an enemy on the battlefield unless you know that enemy first. We did not know the enemy we were fighting in Vietnam. We had absolutely no idea about this concept of iron will. I think what we failed to understand was that we perhaps were fighting Vietnam's greatest generation. So during his trip to Vietnam this time to launch the book, uh, James visited Hanoi and where he called at the military museum, uh, the Museum of Military History. So we'll take a look at some footages from that event. Together with a friend, today James returned to the Vietnam Military History Museum 
which is located at the foot of the flag tower of Hanoi. He came here twice before, many years ago, to do research for his book, Bare Feet Iron Wheel. This MiG-21 fighter was piloted by nine men who shot down in rotation a total of 14 U.S. aircraft between 1967 and 1969. Of the pilots, six was honored as heroes of People's Armed Forces. Among the other visitors to the museum today was a group of Vietnamese veterans from Thái province, some 60 kilometers north of Hanoi. Their excursion was held to mark the 36th anniversary of National Reunification Day on April the 30th. And here came an unexpected meeting between former soldiers on both sides of the battlefield, with James representing American veterans. Trong cái thời gian Mỹ giải chất độc thì nó rất ghê gớm, nhưng chúng tôi lại không biết chất độc ấy là chất độc da cam. Nay trở về vì bản thân bị ảnh hưởng, con cháu bị ảnh hưởng. Và tôi hiện nay cũng đang hưởng chế độ cam. Bây giờ chúng ta còn sống lại thì mong món hai bên đã đoàn kết lại cùng khắc phục những cái hậu quả mà lịch sử đã để lại. Và chúc ông sức khỏe cùng con cháu để ta và người giữa người Mỹ và người Việt Nam chúng ta gần gũi hơn nữa. Thì cùng nhau là, là, là xây dựng cái tốt, cái cuộc sống hòa bình. I thank him for his comments, and I agree with much of what he says. Uh, Agent Orange created a major problem on both sides of the battlefield. Uh, we recognize that on our side. We do not recognize it on the other side. There is a moral obligation for America now to recognize it on the other side. I today have a much better understanding of the suffering and hardship that took place on the other side of the battlefield. And I know that as bad as things were on our side, they were perhaps much worse on their side. And I salute him for surviving. It is the third time James has visited the Vietnam Military History Museum, and it turns out to be an unforgettable visit. When I saw the group of uh, Vietnamese veterans, I cannot help but think how we were looking at many of the things in this museum differently. Uh, obviously, from their standpoint, they see it as uh, uh, victory. Uh, I see it as defeat. And there's always an element of sadness when I see the wreckage of an airplane, uh, not knowing whether or not the pilot survived or, or was killed in the wreckage. So. It's, it's an emotional trip every time I, I come here. Mm -hmm. uh, but mixed emotions are a consequence of, of war, depending on which side of the battlefield you served. So after all of these years, 10 years conducting interviews um, and for, with some 200 Vietnamese veterans, what do you think? do you admire the most about Vietnam in general? Vietnam as a country is beautiful. I think the people are beautiful. I can't understand how we fought a war with them. Uh, it's been a real education for me and I love my country and I stand by my country's decisions but as I said earlier I think that war was a mistake of history. In terms of uh, the, um, the Vietnamese veterans, after you have conducted interviews with so many of them, um, what do you think about them? They're, they're an amazing lot. Um, and my interviews were not just of veterans, but also of uh, uh, wives and mothers. And I think one of the most moving set of interviews I had were with the, uh, the mothers who had lost sons. Uh, Madame May, who I mentioned in my book, uh, sent four sons off to war, lost three within a couple of days. And, you know, I, I think how devastating the loss of my brother was. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to, to uh, say that my loss was, was any more or less severe than hers were. But if you can quantify these things, the loss of three sons is absolutely devastating. And uh, her fourth son was, was uh, severely wounded. So she that was one woman who paid a very heavy price and again I, I, in fact i just 
went over to see her uh, last week and had a very nice uh, discussion with her, but absolutely no animosity or anger. Uh, and that woman has a right to be angry and isn't. Now, in the future, uh, do you plan to write another book about Vietnam? There's that possibility. The, uh, one of the things that I'm hoping to get involved with is a project that uh, the film producer in America, Ken Burns, uh, has indicated that by 2016 he wants to release a documentary on the Vietnam War. And uh, I had sent him a copy of my book because I thought it was important for him to, to see that some interviews have been done to uh, shed some light on what the war was like from the other side of the battlefield and, and uh, said that I, I hoped that they would get into that as well and, and they were very receptive to that. So uh, it will be a while before they come over to Vietnam to do the interviews but uh, one of the things I hope to do is to start identifying veterans who have stories to tell that they would like to, like to share. Uh, the documentary will probably be limited to certain battles and, and I don't yet know where those, which battles are going to be involved, but from my own standpoint, I, I don't care which battle it was, anything that any Vietnamese veteran has that they want to share, I would love to get so that maybe it will give me fuel for a second book. Exactly, and and I believe that even for um, that movie that Ken Burns is uh, is planning, you you would make a great bridge um, in terms of uh, bridging over information that you might have or um, stories that you obviously have compiled throughout your years of spending your time here in Vietnam. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Zumwalt, for joining here with us here on Talk Vietnam, sharing your stories. Um, and we continue to hope that you'll come back to Vietnam uh, with more. Well, the only thing that would stop me, like the Vietnamese veterans told me, was death and near death. <laughs> the story of how James Zumwalt's family has been able to overcome their own tragedy in reaching towards a positive action, a positive attitude, and also a different perspective about the other side, Vietnam, has also mirrored the reconciliation between Vietnam and the United States. In a broader perspective, it also shows that reconciliation between these countries can only come from reconciliation within each and every individual that is involved. That is it for this edition so far of Talk Vietnam. We hope that you enjoyed the talk, and we'll see you more next time here on the show. Thank you very much.